bull. And uh, this is a history of the boom and bust. It covers the bull market from 1982 and the crash after until 2004. And it is a great book. I would definitely recommend this to pretty much almost anyone interested in investing in the stock market, especially now. But almost especially any time, actually, there are just so many useful tidbits. And so the first thing I would say is the overarching story is really powerful. It's it's really colorful. It uh, has lots of anecdotes. I, I wouldn't say it's a light read, but as far as economic stock market nonfiction books go, it is quite enjoyable as a read um, just because it's really almost telling the whole thing as a story. Now, like I said, there's lots and lots of tidbits and pieces of information that are so valuable, I think, um, because there's so many smart people interviewed in the book, whether their statements um, from the time period that the book is analyzing or maybe an interview that was given after the time period and so a retrospective so people are commenting about what people had thought and maybe why they were wrong or why they were right. Um, so just, you know, really useful when you're trying to get into the mind's eye of some of these people. Uh, why did they think what they thought? Was it wrong? Why was it wrong? That itself is really useful. Uh, but like I said, the tidbits so, uh, are, are probably more useful. Now, some of the people that appear in this book, for example, Abby, Abby Joseph Cohen, Mary Meeker, Henry Blodgett, Alan Greenspan. And so if you know these people, you know the story, maybe you won't enjoy the book quite as much. But me, I didn't quite know these people. I didn't really invest in the stock market during this time at all. And so this was I found quite interesting. And of, you know, I might have heard of these people, but now I get much more you know, behind the scenes, uh, what was going on, were there conflicts of interest, were, did they believe what they believe, uh, were they right, were they eventually proven right even though the market crashed. Um, you know, I thought that this was a really powerful book and there was just so many lessons and like I said, tidbits. So let's get to a few tidbits right now. Um, so here you can see that there's this mention on page 178 and I want to be clear, I didn't pick the best things from the book. No, I read this book a long time ago and I kind of reread it and, uh, you know, picked it up, put it down. Um, it's, you know, hard, I think, somewhat to read again in the sense that it's telling you a story and you already know the story now uh, that you've read it once. I don't like reading, you know, uh, fiction more than once, I suppose. And I don't really read fiction that much at all. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't, I, the second time around, I didn't quite enjoy it as much, to be fair. But I did pick up for this review just some random pages and I would read, you know, a page or two. I was enjoying it quite a bit and I would find, you know, gold, uh, you know, gems. And so I just picked a few, you know, maybe the four best ones out of, you know, 10 or 12 that I had found. And uh, they're sprinkled throughout the book. So here, you know, is mentioned that the problem in a runaway bull market is that there's too much money and too much credit is chasing too few stocks in virtually every sector of the economy might sound familiar nowadays. And whenever there's too much money on the table, the crooks come out of the woodwork. In the 90s, creative accounting, quote unquote, became an accepted management technique in even the most old fashioned industries. So pretty much by saying the word, you know, crooks, uh, really implying fraud. I don't know if it's necessarily fraud, because you know, one of the cases they mention is that this company eliminated medical and life insurance for their retirees. Now, maybe you'll say that's mean. But that quote unquote, liberal accounting uh, really is true. That's not fraud. It, now, when someone reads that their costs, uh, you know, their costs were cut, uh, they might think that yes, we can, you know, improve this company, keep cutting costs. When in reality, this cost-cutting measure, you can't reproduce. You know, you can't make it better. They've already, you know, those medical and life insurance fees have been cut. So it's a one-time kind of uh, improvement to the stock. So maybe people were misled, I suppose, but I wouldn't call that necessarily fraud. But nevertheless, what they're trying to point out is. Yes, there's people who will push companies, push stocks to really try and follow the mania. And some of it, some of it really will be fraud, of course. And it does, you know, discuss some of the, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily fraudulent, but I do remember, you know, AOL uh, doing some, I suppose, shady things when you're trying to run a reputable company, maybe doing the wrong things. And, you know, what happened to the whole company? What was their motivation? Just buying up smaller companies. And was that the right approach? And, you know, was there going to be doom and gloom soon? And was it going to be their problem or someone else's problem who buys AOL, for example? Uh, you know, and so all of these little stories come together and paint a really, really powerful picture. What were people thinking? What was going on? I, I don't know. I found it fascinating. And on that topic, you know, Merrill Lynch, there's Bob Farrell, who mentions um, that the fund managers 
right? They have to invest people's money and they get ranked based off of their return. You know, did they beat the S&P 500 or not? And so he says they're buying what's working. Most managers have lagged the market. So even though these big stocks are overextended, the managers keep buying them out of fear of falling further behind. So, you know, imagine nowadays Tesla, for example, you know, maybe someone didn't buy it. They thought it's overpriced, but now it's grown so much. You know, how could they not buy it now? And so you might be looking at this stock. How could anyone in the right mind buy it? Well, they have to buy it because they don't want to fall further behind. What happens if it grows? Um, and, you know, you get all these little tidbits of kind of psychological machinations of people. And yes, is it right? Is it wrong? I, you know, obviously you can see how it caused or I don't know caused, but how the crash could impact all of this. And so I don't want to say it's right or wrong, but you get the psychological perspective of even people who had, you know, become fund managers. Obviously, they're good with money and they're good with the stock market. And yet you can see how the psychology of them at their job trying to protect, you know, their uh, return on investment. And keep in mind, you know, um, their return on investment just has to be the S beat the S&P 500. So even if the S&P 500 loses 10%, if they only lose one, you know, that's a good thing for them. So really interesting perspective. And the book really does do a very powerful job of giving you the perspective of, you know, fund managers or the media or uh, the Federal Reserve or the individual investor or the value investor, you know, all these different people uh, and what their perspectives and how they felt, I suppose, or how they're quoted as, you know, what they said, I suppose, is a better way of saying it. But you kind of get this feeling just because of the colorful writing. And once again, you know, I don't know if you have to take everything the author is saying, uh, you know, as gospel, as true. You take it with a grain of salt, especially because they're sometimes quoting people who can be right or wrong. Uh, you know, and I think that's really important to mention. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives you kind of a look behind the curtains of everything that's going on, all the politics, all the different people involved. I, I thought it was a very powerful book. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, you know, this Henry Blodgett that we mentioned before, so he's in an interview and the CNBC anchor said, if you have $50,000 to invest, which internet stocks would you buy? And, you know, pretty much he says, I wouldn't invest unless I had such a big portfolio. That 50000 would only be 5% because of this is such a high risk. And uh, the interviewer pretty much says, oh, yes, of course. But I'm just saying, once you have that $50,000 to invest in internet stocks, which would you buy? And um, so if you're just sitting there watching the TV or whatever it is and you're not really paying attention, well, he's going to list some stocks that he thinks will grow. But really what he's sounding the alarm almost um, is, is to say that like, no, you, you know, this is just as a gamble. This isn't what you should be doing with your $50,000 unless you have such a massive portfolio that this small percentage could be used on this type of gamble. And uh, I, th I think what's amazing is, you know, that kind of alarm should trigger something in your brain. And so if you hear that nowadays, uh, you can kind of relate that kind of statement and I think that's really important. But also you can kind of see, once again, the psychology of this CNBC anchor who kind of brushed past it, not like, oh, wait, so you're saying that these are high-risk stocks that could just crash? Right, he didn't say that. That would have been really important information and news. Uh, he brushed past that and he just was looking at, you know, what were the best stocks in the internet that's growing and it's, you know, so exciting and this whole mania. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, you know, once again, another... Uh, I thought a very interesting tidbit was that people would say the bear market would begin in March of 2000. And the book is pretty much saying, well, maybe it really started in 1999 because by March 1st of 2000, the stocks trading on the NASDAQ had climbed 3.1 trillion in 12 months. However, uh, if you look over those same 12 months, the value of all U.S. stocks, including the NASDAQ, rose only 2.1 trillion. So if you subtract that NASDAQ gain from all those stocks gain, you know, pretty much they're saying the market had fallen $600 billion. Uh, and so that's an amazing idea that almost like a year in advance, or certainly months and months, but it sounds like a year in advance because they're tracking this over 12 months, um, you can kind of start to see the bear really starting. Because when you're looking only at the NASDAQ, oh yes, everything's better, it's growing. But when you're looking at the whole market as a whole, and so you could kind of get a signal, um, you know, if you're in a bull market, well, if the whole market as a whole is going down, even if the S&P 500 or NASDAQ is going up, hey, there could be a massive bear market coming and this would be a very great signal. Now, not every crash is the same, not every bull market is the same, so I'm not saying it will work, but I am saying that sometimes there are signals. And so if you see something alarming, uh, well, don't just 
ignore it because everyone else is. Um, you know, and so these tidbits just, you know, I think they're just fascinating. And they mentioned uh, at the very end of the book on page 396 that tips, which pretty much are these government bonds that are supposed to protect you against inflation, uh, well, they don't necessarily perfectly protect you. Why? Because they're based off of the consumer price index and the government who pretty much when you buy the bond, let's say $10,000 and they're going to give you 2%, well, they'll give you not just the 2% return, they'll protect you uh, from inflation and they'll give you beyond the 2%. So if inflation, let's say, is, is, is too high, they'll tack on some amount of money to protect you from inflation. So 5% inflation, you know, they'll tack on some money to protect you. Um, now, of course, they're mentioning here a very interesting point that there's a conflict of interest because the government wants to keep the CPI as low as possible because the higher the CPI, the more they have to pay Social Security. And the higher the CPI, the higher the inflation. So these things are tied. There's a conflict of interest. And, uh, you know, like I said, the CPI is used to calculate the dividends that they pay these TIPS investors. So when you buy that bond, that, that insurance protection bond, um, you know, the government has a conflict of interest to keep it down, not just so they don't have to pay you as much uh, to protect you against inflation, but even just for Social Security. So they may not even realize that they're damaging people who are buying these bonds. Uh, they might just be focusing on the fact that they can't afford to pay out Social Security. And so, you know, maybe they're trying to keep the CPI down. Um, you know, and that's, a, I suppose, a different topic for a different day. But it's just bringing out these really, really informative points. And so I would really recommend this book almost to anyone. I have no affiliate link. I'm not, as of now anyway, on this page, I'm not trying to make any money off of this book. I just thought that it was a really interesting book. I wouldn't say it's an easy read, but it's an interesting read and it's a light read. The thing that I would suggest the most and kind of the one thing I regret after, you know, after reading the book is uh, when you're reading, um, I don't know if you highlight or not, but what I would really suggest even more than highlighting, although that's great too, is... Um, either keeping some sort of journal or writing some notes at the beginning of the book or possibly even better yet is to kind of get some of those sticky note tabs uh, like with the arrows um, and you can just stick it to the page and because the whole book is written like a story and so you know it's hard to find the specific nugget of information oh yeah I remember you know in this chapter or at this time period there were some really interesting things and you might have a lot of these tabs and so it might look a little odd but nevertheless it's it's because it's to, to, told like a story it's hard to find exact information and there's probably 20 pages of index and lots of notes at the back and so you could probably find every time a topic is mentioned but if you just want to know hey where's that nugget well if you had a hundred of these tabs you know it makes it a lot easier to find those nuggets instead of trying to search through 400 pages um, especially when things are organized more in terms of time I suppose um, compared to topics like a regular nonfiction, right? Because it's really taking you through the time period of uh, everything that's going on. So that would be my biggest suggestion. One of the things that I regret after reading the book, but there's just so much great information, whether you think the bull market's coming to an end now or not. Um, you know, we are in a bull market. There will be an end. I think it'll be a valuable, p p you know, uh, book. And even to be fair, after the bull market crash, I still think it's a great book. There's just so much information about investing in here. I, I mean, I think so. Um, is it going to be more than uh, a specific nonfiction book? Probably not, to be fair. But you just get a smattering of really interesting information. You get a whole story. You get this whole vignette. And so between all of those things together, the, the tidbits of information, the whole story, and the well-written, and you're getting a history book, and, you know, history, uh, like they say, it doesn't necessarily repeat, but does rhyme. Um, I think that it's a really, really valuable book, and it's one that I would suggest uh, to pretty much anyone, I think, especially if you're watching this channel. Um, so thanks for watching, and uh, let me know if you want more book reviews. I've definitely read quite, quite a few books on uh, the subject of stock markets and investing, and... Uh, you know, I thought I would share and uh, I thought it might be very timely to share this type of book. All right. Thanks for watching.